Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is the Mulrani Police Conspiracy. This podcast focuses on a little known story that took place in the west of Ireland around the turn of the 20th century. The setting is Mulrani, a stunning village along the wild Atlantic Way, but in 1900 it was something of a forgotten backwater. However, events that took place there are fascinating. As you are about to hear, the Mulrani police conspiracy unveiled a dark story of deceit set to the backdrop of a struggle for justice in an impoverished community in County Mayo. This show is out of the regular schedule, but as many of you will know, I've been unwell over the last two months. Regular service is now restored and there's a great lineup of podcasts on the way. The next show is a return to the Great Famine series and since it's been a while, that episode will bring you all up to speed. This will fit neatly in with the premiere of the movie Black 47. If you haven't heard about this, it's a major blockbuster set in Ireland during the Great Hunger. I have tickets to an advanced screening, so I'll be making a preview podcast of that film, which will be out in late August as well. From there, we'll head on into the concluding years of the Great Famine. There's also a few live podcasts coming up, but more about them later in the show. Before we begin, I want to thank the show patrons, without whom this podcast would not exist. Lots of folks assume there's a group of people who work on the show. There isn't, it's just me. So I do all the research, the editing and the production. I do it full time along with tours, so I think you can appreciate how much patron support means to me. They are the people who keep this series on the road. There are listeners like you who have signed up at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast to get lots of extra materials such as episode guides and exclusive podcasts. Patrons also get a shout out and in today's show I want to thank Abu Noor Ryan, Carla Gates, Adrian Hughes, Bart Nadeau, Adriana Pitta, Channon Wilson, April Zakarna, Ashling, Clearly Foe, Justin Rice, Carl Connolly and Kathleen Aker. Your support means so much folks, I'm really grateful. If you want to support the show, become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Irish podcast. Now we begin today's episode by turning to the town of Mulrani in County Mayo at the turn of the 20th century. The Wild Atlantic Way is a 1500 mile long tourist trail that follows the west coast of Ireland from Cork to Donegal. It incorporates some of Ireland's most stunning scenery from towering cliffs to spectacular beaches. As the trail follows the Atlantic coast through Connacht, it winds its way around Clue Bay, a unique inlet containing hundreds of small islands until it eventually reaches the town of Mulrani which stretches along the northern shores of the bay. Mulrani is located in an exceptionally stunning environment. To the north is Nathan Mountain, which looms over Eris, a vast 850 square kilometre wilderness of peat bog, which stretches all the way to Broadhaven Bay. Mulrani is also the gateway to Ackill Island, which lies to its west, jutting out into the Atlantic Ocean, and then across the waters of Clue Bay, Crow Patrick, a mountain long held as sacred, and the site of pilgrimages, dominates the southern skyline. Visitors to this region have long been mesmerised by these vistas. Even a man like William Makepeace Thackeray, a virulent racist English journalist whose articles in Punch magazine lampooned the very people who lived in this part of the world during the Great Famine, couldn't but be impressed. He described the vistas as the most most beautiful view view I ever ever saw saw in the world. world. Unsurprising, Given it was surrounded by such stunning scenery, the town of Mulrani itself made little impression on passing visitors. At the turn of the 20th century, it, like many towns that are now pit stops along the wild Atlantic Way, were still haunted by the Great Famine of the 1840s. Across the West, even though the birth rate far outstripped the death rate, the population was rapidly declining. This was due to emigration. In the 1890s alone, 10% of Ireland's population left the island. Mulrani itself at the turn of the 20th century was small, scarcely a few hundred metres from one end to another, basically a collection of buildings that provided all the necessities of life and little more for the 250 or so people who called it home. There was a school, a forge, a police barracks that would be central to the following story 
and no less than six public houses in the town and immediate hinterland. What was a sign of progress in the late 19th century, the train had reached Mulrani in the 1880s when the line connecting Ackle Island to the mainland passed through. This was followed by the opening of a railway hotel in 1897 at the western end of the town. However, by and large, Mulrani remained something of a quiet backwater, the sort of place people passed through. Visitors were generally heading elsewhere, usually Ackle Island. While Mulrani's railway hotel offered travellers the last warm bed before Ackle Sound, the narrow stretch of water that separated the island from the mainland, the town itself made little impression on visitors. The diaries and letters of Victorian tourists rarely mention Mulrani. They, by and large, saved their words for the beauty of Ackle Island. That was until the 1890s when this quiet town was dominated by a dark conspiracy that pitted the townspeople against some of the most powerful forces in Irish society at the time. While beautiful landscapes like that surrounding Mulrani are mesmerising, their appeal can diminish when you are faced with the prospect of living and working in such remote places. Such landscapes are transformed in winter and none more so than those of western Mayo. When wind howled in from the Atlantic Ocean sweeping through Mulrani at the turn of the 20th century, the beauty of the landscape lost its charm and was replaced by loneliness and isolation. One man who fully appreciated this was John Curtin, a newly qualified police constable in the Royal Irish Constabulary, who arrived in Mulrani in 1896 on his first posting. Later, when describing the town, he could not but mention the fine scenery and romantic surroundings, but this was offset by what he called the lonely little station that was now his home, coupled with the slow and monotonous life on the shores of Clue Bay. Indeed, the slow and monotonous life meant that this posting in Mulrani was something of a career cul-de-sac. There was little or nothing to do, and in Curtin's own words, it was, it was a, poor a poor place for any, any chance, chance of promotion. promotion. And worse still, the loneliness and isolation were exacerbated by the fact that constables like Curtin were disliked by many in the community. This, in part at least, resulted from the fact that the Royal Irish Constabulary, known as the RIC, found themselves with little to do, and as the saying goes, the devil makes work for idle hands. The records of the local court sessions show the Mulrani RIC constables spent their time, essentially, harassing the local population with petty charges. Constable John Curtin himself would later reflect on his time in Mulrani, saying that constables, having, having to do something, something as an apology for our existence in the way of summoning to court publicans who sold drink after hours, or fellows coming home drunk from the fair, or farmers who didn't paint their names on their carts. While this alienated members of the RAC from the local community, the truth of the matter was that relations had never been great. By and large, the RAC were seen as an army of occupation, and in relatively recent memory, they had waged what was a low-level war on the population. In the late 1870s, Mayo had been the epicentre of a major struggle known as the Land War, which saw landlords on one side pitted against tenants demanding rights on the other. The RIC had not been neutral, but had been the defenders of powerful landlords in this struggle. They had been to the fore of breaking up the tenants' organisation, the Land League. They carried out evictions, and when the government brought in what was known as a Coercion Act, basically a suspension of basic rights and freedoms, the RIC had locked up scores without trial. This left a bitter taste in communities like Mulrani. While regulations banning members of the RIC socialising in public houses had been lifted by the time John Curtin arrived in the town, he undoubtedly still would have been greeted with suspicion by many in Mulrani's pubs. Bad as the situation he faced was, things got decidedly worse in 1898. The local community began to organise into a new tenants' movement to take on the power of landlords, and this would mean conflict with the RIC was inevitable. However, few anticipated the police response. The land war which had taken place between 1879 and 1882 had been the most significant event in post-famine Ireland in the 19th century. Despite being continually harassed by constables, the tenants' movement, known as the Land League, had won some major concessions, but many of the core issues at its heart had been left unresolved. Then, through the 1880s and 1890s, the movement for tenants' rights 
had declined somewhat. Successes were offset by internal disputes and scandals. Charles Stuart Parnell, the leading figure associated with the movement, was named in a divorce case in 1889 and his refusal to resign in light of this resulted in the movement being split into two rival camps. Eventually, in 1898, a new organisation emerged. This was the United Irish League, founded in Westport under the slogan The Land for the People in January 1898. At a demonstration held in Park, not too far from Mulrani, one of the speakers articulated what the League stood for. The country is declining fast, the population of Ireland is decreasing, and while Ireland is going down, England is springing up. What has the people to live on? It's the land. And when their money and their land is grabbed, how can they live? The animals live on the rich land and the people on the bog land. In order for the people to be able to live, they need to get more land and the rent must be reduced. Mulrani proved fertile ground for such ideas. Three siblings, Patrick, Kate and Peter O'Donnell, the children of a local publican, Neil O'Donnell, began to organise the league and gained support in the surrounding hinterland. The RIC in the town immediately saw this as potential trouble and prepared for conflict. January 1898 saw the arrival of four more constables, bringing the total number in the garrison to eight. They would quickly be needed. Indeed, they were scarcely in the town a few weeks before the situation began to escalate rapidly. The United Irish League were focusing their energies in Mulrani on Robert Vesey Stoney, a landlord who lived in Ross Turk Castle a few miles to the east of the town. Stoney was disliked by many in the area for multiple reasons. Not only was the man a landlord who owned thousands of acres in the region, but in 1888 he had been embroiled in a major scandal. An investigation had revealed Stoney had misused public money set aside to aid those who couldn't afford to emigrate. This had seen him dismissed as Deputy Lieutenant of County Mayo. In the 1890s, Stoney had evicted tenants and this made him the perfect target for the United Irish League who decided to boycott him. This was deeply worrying for a man like John Curtin and the other members of the RIC in the town. By today's standards, boycotting, as practised in 19th century Ireland by the United Irish League, would be deemed an extremely violent protest. Stoney and anyone who associated with him were socially ostracised by the community and those who did faced being boycotted themselves. The United Irish League leaders even advocated refusing them drink in pubs and service in shops. In Mulrani, threatening letters were sent to Stoney's employees warning them to leave his service. If they didn't, it was very quickly made clear that the threat was deadly serious. Indeed, one of Stoney's employees, Martin Kelly, was badly beaten for trying to defy the League. Unpalatable as attacks like this were, they proved very effective, and the landlord Stoney was struggling to find workers early in 1898. The RIC, unable to stop these attacks, began to resort to harassing United Irish League activists in Mulrani in the hope that this would undermine their campaign. The constables did this through what they called put-up jobs. Constable John Curtin himself later detailed what these put-up jobs were. In his words, they were such, such base, base tricks, tricks as concealing putchin, as, as Irish, Irish moonshine is called, on some, some poor peasant's premises without his knowledge, knowledge and then having him arrested, convicted and imprisoned. After trawling through the records, I found the case that Curtin was referring to. On February the 8th, 1898, the house of John Mulgrew, a member of the United Irish League, was raided and the RAC found putchin. For Mulgrew, this had major consequences. He would, after a failed appeal, be imprisoned. However, the police were not finished with him yet. In what would become a feature of life in the town, they constantly harassed Mulgrew when they could. While he was appealing his prison sentence, Mulgrew was arrested again on St. Patrick's Day 1898, this time for the petty charge of being drunk in public. Eventually, on April 10th, 1898, John Mulgrew began a three-month sentence for a crime he was completely innocent of. But his case registered with few outside the area. To most, he just seemed like a bootlegger. However, after events in Mulrani a few days later, the town, which had been a backwater in most people's eyes, would soon take the limelight on the national stage. As the summer approached, the United Irish League's campaign against the landlord Robert Stoney reached a critical juncture. While the constabulary were harassing their members, the League had nevertheless forced most of his staff 
to leave his employment. However, each year, large numbers of Irish people travelled to England and Scotland as migrant labourers to work on the harvest before returning to Ireland in the autumn. Their absence naturally weakened the campaign over the summer. Indeed, as the migrants prepared to leave in April 1898, word began to spread through the community that some of the workers of the landlord Robert Stoney were going to take advantage of their absence and break the boycott by returning to work. Rumours centred on a man called Martin Kelly, the same man who had already been beaten earlier in the year. This was where the boycott would succeed or fail. If Kelly returned to work, others would inevitably follow. As many perceived this to be a make-or-break moment, another attack on Martin Kelly seemed highly likely. Indeed, Sergeant Sullivan, the top constable in the police station in Mulrani, had patrols on the roads near Martin Kelly's house as early as April 10th, 1898. Nothing happened until four days later when orders came to move on Martin Kelly in the form of a letter which arrived in Mulrani on Thursday, April 14th. This was addressed to a man somewhat confusingly called James Kelly, a member of the United Irish League in the area. It's worth remembering the man being targeted is called Martin Kelly. Anyway, the handwritten letter opened with the following words. Two shillings are enclosed for drink. It then continued. April 13th, 1898. Dear James Kelly, as you are aware that Martin Kelly has gone back to that bastard Stoney on Monday, go with some of the boys and visit him and tell him if he work he will be sorry and that he is working against our cause. It will be better to blacken your faces. Do it tomorrow night and watch for the police. Other houses will be visited on the same night. John McHale, Chairman, United Irish League. Burn this for fear of danger. Don't bring any man but one you entrust. The order was clear. The highest echelons of the United Irish League wanted action against the man who would break the boycott. And this was to take place on the night of April 14th and one could certainly read between the lines of the letter that it might involve a little more than a stern chat. However, the plan had a snag. The man who received the letter, James Kelly, wasn't able to read very well, so he took the letter to his cousin, another League activist. On reading the text, this cousin was immediately suspicious and advised James Kelly to talk to McHale before doing anything. As it turned out, James Kelly was extremely lucky. The police were well aware of the rising tension and hostility and on the very night the letter instructed him to threaten Martin Kelly, April 14th, 1898, Sergeant Sullivan and three other constables were lying in wait in case there would be such a visit. However, while the threat against Martin Kelly was never carried out, the ramifications of this letter were far-reaching. Dozens would suffer because of it. Two days after it had arrived, John McHale, the President of the United Irish League, The man who had penned the letter arrived in the town and Constable John Curtin was assigned by the police to investigate what such a figure was doing in a small town like Mulrani. He had travelled a considerable distance, 30 miles from his home in Westport. This was by no means a casual visit. In the course of his inquiries, Curtin heard what were explosive rumours circulating through Mulrani. McHale had been informed as to the existence of the letter and immediately arrived to investigate it as he claimed he had no knowledge of it. He hadn't written it. Then when he and several other people in Mulrani saw the letter itself, they claimed they recognised the handwriting to be none other than that of Sergeant James Sullivan, the head constable in Mulrani. This was an explosive accusation. Curtin was astounded and unsure what to believe. Meanwhile, the president of the League, John McHale, and numerous Mulrani activists began to search for evidence to prove that the sergeant was guilty. If they could expose corruption of the nature they suspected in the RIC, it would be a major publicity coup in their struggle for tenants' rights. To do this, they needed to get numerous copies of Sergeant Sullivan's handwriting. They secured one from a letter Sullivan himself had written on behalf of a Mulrani woman to her solicitor, Another was ascertained from the Mayo News newspaper. But they were so desperate to get more that the United Irish League activist Kate O'Donnell began writing love letters to Sullivan in the hope he would reply. These would eventually amount to four in total, one more desperate than the other, with O'Donnell in what were more innocent times offering Sullivan kisses if he would reply to her. This failed, but eventually they managed to secure five samples of his writing. In a small town like Morani, though, it didn't take long before Sergeant Sullivan was alerted to the fact that activists were trying to get copies of his writing. 
He in turn tried to retrieve any copies of his writing he knew to be in existence in the town, something which certainly questions his innocence. Once he had the evidence he needed, the president of the United Irish League, John McHale, went public with the accusation against Sullivan by suing him in court. This was the beginning of an extraordinary case where a member of the police was being accused of trying to organise a crime, a crime that he would then try and stop. However, this only began the story of illegal police behaviour in Moranido. Sergeant Sullivan himself would deny all charges, instead claiming that the United Irish League and McHale were organising a conspiracy and a political witch hunt against him. The first court appearance took place in early July across the waters of Clue Bay from Morani in the town of Westport. This was only to judge whether there was enough evidence for a full trial, but the judges present were clearly biased. Most were landlords themselves and naturally hostile to McHale and the United Irish League. They tried to stop the case going forward, but the high-profile legal team prosecuting the case for McHale were able to bring forward charges of criminal libel against Sergeant Sullivan to be heard in Castle Bar a fortnight later. The police, led by Sergeant Sullivan, took advantage of this window and turned up the pressure in Morani, harassing United Irish League activists, presumably in the hope of getting the case dropped. On July 6th, one witness, John Conway, was arrested and charged with letting his animals loose on the public road. Two days before the trial opened, James Kelly, the key witness against the police, the man who had received the forged letter, was arrested by the RIC in Mulrani on charges of being drunk in public. Then, the day before the trial opened, Neil O'Donnell, father of the three key United Irish League activists in the town and all witnesses in the upcoming trial, was arrested in his case for allowing his animals to roam on a public road. At the same time, in the police barracks in the town, Constable John Curtin began to grow uneasy about the case. He had had reservations. He had seen Sullivan try to stop samples of his writing falling into the prosecution's hands. Sullivan himself had also inferred he might be guilty in some of the things he had said to Curtin. However, it was when he went back to look at police records for the night of April 14th, when the attack in the letter was supposed to take place, that the conscience got the better of him. Curtin found that the patrol logs had been altered. He knew for a fact Sergeant Sullivan had been at Martin Kelly's house that night until 1am. However, now the books had been poorly altered to say he had returned as normal to the barracks at 11pm. This was significant as Sullivan staying out until 1am indicated he had knowledge something was going to happen at this house or as the prosecution would argue he had organised something to happen. On discovering this, Curtin sensationally contacted McHale's legal team and his superiors in the police with this evidence. While McHale's team were elated to have such a great witness, his superiors, however, were less than impressed and basically asked the whistleblower why he was sticking his nose in where it didn't belong. They saw Curtin as a liability to the RIC that was now circling around Sergeant Sullivan, so they decided to silence him by sending him to the most remote place in their jurisdiction, the Inishki Islands. This was done before the Castle Bar trials opened in the hope that Curtin would be beyond the reach of McHale's legal team. If you listened to the last show on the Inishki Islands and how remote they are, you'll get a sense of how effective this could be. Nevertheless, the trial in Castle Bar went ahead. Despite his attempt to destroy the case, Sullivan can only have been extremely worried by the developments there. Curtin did not testify, but the United Irish League was clearly going to spend whatever they needed to win this case. The judges in Westport had questioned whether the testimony of one handwriting expert was enough, so now they had acquired the service of two world experts. Both were brought from London, Thomas Henry Gurren, frequently employed by the British Home Office and the Bank of England, and Francis Price, an employee of the British Museum. These men would testify that even though the author of the letter had attempted to mask their handwriting, they were satisfied it was Sergeant James Sullivan. However, the Castle Bar hearing was dominated by legal wrangling and a full hearing was postponed until the next sitting of the Connacht Assizes, which was not until December 1898. With five long months before the start of what would be the third hearing, the RIC in Mulrani, led by Sergeant Sullivan, decided they would now turn to less than legal methods to collapse the trial. The Royal Irish Constabulary had long subjected the people of Mulrani to petty harassment before any of these court cases ever began. But as 
the full hearing of this case approached in December 1898, they really intensified this. As early as the 26th of July, Neil O'Donnell, the father of the three Central United Irish League activists in Mulrani, was again arrested on petty charges relating to his cattle roaming public roads. This was only the beginning because in September the RIC made a much more concerted effort to destroy the case. They initially tried to bribe key witnesses. Early in the month, the central witness, James Kelly, who had received the forged letter, was offered money by Sergeant Sullivan to leave Mulrani and emigrate to the USA. After he refused this, they turned to more severe repression. On September the 26th, John McHale, the man taking the case, was stopped for being drunk and disorderly on the streets of Westport, his hometown. When the police went to arrest McHale, they claimed he threw himself on the ground and in the following fracas assaulted two constables. It was at this point that James Kelly, who had been with McHale moments earlier, arrived back on the scene and tried to free him. A near riot broke out in the streets of Westport as the townspeople saw what was happening and tried to free John McHale. When the case went to court, all the constables testified John McHale was drunk, but all the civilian witnesses said he was sober. While it is possible McHale was drunk, there are pretty suspicious aspects to the case. Firstly, McHale and James Kelly, the two central people in this trial, lived 30 miles apart, yet it was on a rare day that the two men were together that the police decided to arrest them. Secondly, once he was arrested, McHale had asked for a doctor who, had he arrived, would have proven whether he was drunk or not. However, the RIC did not get one until the following morning. On this instance, McHale was found guilty and fined five shillings. James Kelly, who had also been arrested, was taken to court and convicted as well. In October, the police were again targeting James Kelly, or in this case his family. His 68-year-old father was targeted for being drunk and disorderly. He would, like McHale, claim he had been sober and that it was actually he who had been assaulted by the police. His appeal against his conviction failed and he was sentenced to a month in prison. Meanwhile, John Curtin, another key witness, was languishing out on Inishki at, at this point, the lone policeman to break ranks. In the House of Commons in London, John Dillon, the MP for East Mayo, would liken his time on Inishki to a sentence on Devil's Island, a reference to a notorious French prison colony on an island off the coast of French Guyana. These months must have been remarkably difficult for Curtin. His future was bleak. There was scarcely a police constable in the country, let alone the county, who would speak to him. Indeed, all other constables, despite the serious charges against Sullivan, seemed to be rallying around the sergeant and they had actually established a fund to support him. For all involved, late 1898 was a hard time. None knew what would happen next. When would the police strike? Who would be arrested? Surely, at times, they must have felt it would be easier to back down, but they persevered. Finally, the long-awaited Connacht Assizes arrived during the depths of winter in early December 1898. For the witnesses, the journey they had to undertake to Sligo, over 80 miles from Mulrani, was considerable. Even at the turn of the 20th century, roads were appalling in the middle of winter and they had only eight hours of daylight each day. For John Curtin, he had to make the risky journey from Inishki and undoubtedly there was many in the RIC hoping he wouldn't make it. The case in Sligo dragged on over several days and for the time that was a lengthy enough trial. However, it should have been much longer. In what was a spectacular decision on behalf of the jury, they stated they did not need to hear the defence case at all. They had their minds made up after the prosecution closed their case. Now for the people of Mulrani, they had waited for this moment for months. They had endured harassment since April and they had hoped this decision would vindicate everything they had gone through. However, the jury found Sullivan not guilty. While it was legal not to hear the defence arguments, it was considered poor practice and many took this to be proof that the jury had been rigged. Some also pointed to the fact that there was no Catholics on the jury as further evidence of this. However, all was not lost and John McHale and the United Irish League proved to be relentless adversaries for Sergeant Sullivan. Having failed in the criminal courts, they now turned to the civil courts in Dublin where McHale personally sued Sullivan for libel. This would not carry a criminal conviction, but if guilty, Sullivan would have to compensate McHale. This trial was scheduled for May 1899. 
In the months preceding this, the police in Milrani again intimidated witnesses. They were caught beating a horse belonging to the witness John Conway, but when he tried to sue the constables in court, they immediately charged him for having a horse wandering in public. And then, a few weeks later, they would charge him with mistreating his own horse. Neil O'Donnell, the father of the O'Donnell siblings who owned a pub in Mulrani, was charged for the third time in eight months, each charge more ridiculous than the last. On this occasion, his crime was walking a dog without a muzzle. Indeed, he'd be charged for a fourth time on St. Patrick's Day, 1899, for displaying a harp on his pub on St. Patrick's Day. A few weeks later, though, the case was finally heard before the High Court in Dublin in May. There was a new judge and jury, so the evidence was gone through yet again. For Mikhail, on this occasion, the burden of proof he needed was extremely high. It was only a unanimous decision in his favour would work. Given the politicised nature of the trial, this was going to be extremely difficult. There were all too many in Irish society who disliked the United Irish League and its activities and would vote against Mikhail on principle. That said, his legal team did extraordinarily well and when the jury returned, they had 10 of the 12 voting in his favour. But that wasn't enough. The judge asked the jury to retire one more time and see if they could come back with a unanimous decision. But they said it was pointless, given the divisions amongst them. It was clear now, Sergeant James Sullivan would get off. This decision and the failure of the trial brought an end to the legal saga. James Sullivan was, legally speaking anyway, not guilty. However, having read the reports of the case over three different trials, I have few doubts that Sergeant James Sullivan forged that letter. Why he did this is more disputable. Constable John Curtin always maintained Sullivan's actions were an attempt to secure promotion in Mulrani, a place that was often a career dead end. Neither he nor McHale, for that matter, ever implied there was a bigger conspiracy at work to bring down the United Irish League. That said, the hierarchy of the RIC, who presumably knew Sullivan was guilty, given the evidence, still backed him to the hilt and aided with fundraising efforts for him. On the balance of things, I think Sullivan probably did actually concoct the scheme on his own, purely because it was so amateurish. The fact that he himself penned the letter in a community where many would recognise what his writing looked like indicates it was never really that well thought out. For the United Irish League, while they had lost in terms of legal arguments, the process proved enormously beneficial given the press coverage it gave them at a crucial stage in their growth. The case also demonstrated for many that the RIC had acted illegally. The personal cost to those involved varied massively. The trial made John McHale something of a national figure and in many ways you could say he benefited from it. Others were not so fortunate. John Curtin, unsurprisingly, left the RIC shortly afterwards and had emigrated to the USA by 1902. When he arrived there, he was feted by the Irish-American community who saw him as something of a hero. Back on the shores of Clue Bay, life for the people of Mulrani seems to have slowly returned to normal. Sergeant James Sullivan was transferred from the town shortly after the trial. Whether this was a promotion or a demotion is not clear, but Sullivan was undoubtedly happy to leave a town where he was despised. The community were presumably delighted to see the back of a man who had caused them so much trouble. The police campaign against the community declined rapidly after the trial. The RIC would continue to harass people for being drunk or walking their dogs without muzzles, but there's no evidence to suggest it was now politically motivated. Overall, the Mulrani police conspiracy on a personal level proved so costly for those involved, but on a wider level, the United Irish League, although on the losing side, were unquestionably the winners. The trial also was, in many ways, another wound in the legitimacy of British rule in Ireland, as it seemed to confirm a view held by Manny that it was, at its core, unjust. That brings today's show to an end. If you want to book tickets for that one-off medieval tour of Dublin, get in touch today at history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. That's history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. Next time, we're going to finally return to the Great Famine series. Until then, slon. So